Welcome to the podcast of Grace Community Bible Church. We hope and pray that you are blessed, challenged, and inspired by this message. For other sermons or more information, visit us at gracebiblechurch.org.au. I take the opportunity for a further Bible reading. So come with me in your scriptures. I'm going to the Gospel of Mark, Mark's Gospel, and the sixth chapter. Mark chapter 6. I'm breaking into the chapter at verse 45 and reading down to the end of verse 51. But Mark chapter 6 and verse 45. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, where he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and they cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. May God be pleased to bless to us this portion of his word this morning. We come again to that book which we began considering two weeks ago, the book of Jonah. And so I'm turning back to this Old Testament prophet, this uh, little book, as it were, that you find there in your Old Testament. These four chapters that contain the, the record of God's dealings with this, this man, Jonah. And you know, a couple of, uh, a couple of years ago, I reread a book that I had first read when I was a boy. And in those days, you either borrowed the book from the local library or you went to a bookstore and bought it, whereas uh, today, these days, you can download it in seconds uh, for nothing. And so it's a, it's a great book to read, and as I say, it's, it's, it's free. The book is Herman Melville's classic novel, Moby Dick. And I don't know whether many of you or any of you have read it by some of the responses. I think some of you, some of you have. The narrator of the story is a wandering sailor named Ishmael. And he arrives one December night at the Wailing Port of New Bedford in Massachusetts. And he comes to join his first whaling voyage. The next day, a cold, wet Sunday, Ishmael goes to the whaleman's chapel in New Bedford. And at the appropriate time, the the elderly chaplain of this church, of this congregation, a former harpooner named Maple, climbs up into the pulpit. And his sermon that morning, and the sermon is recorded for us in the chapter, the ninth chapter of the book, the sermon that he preaches is a sermon from the book of Jonah. Listen to this old sailor preaching his sermon to a congregation, mainly of sailors. This is how he began his sermon. Shipmates, this book, containing only four chapters, four yarns, is one of the smallest strands in the mighty cable of the Scriptures. 
Yet what depth of the soul does Jonah's deep sea line sound? What a pregnant lesson to us is this prophet. What a noble thing is the canticle in the fish's belly. How billow-like and boisterously grand. We feel the flood surging over us. We sound with him to the kelpy bottom of the waters. Seaweed and all the slime of the sea is all about us. But what is this lesson that the book of Jonah teaches? Shipmates, it is a two-stranded lesson. A lesson for us all as sinful men, and a lesson to me as a pilot of the living God. The sin of this son of Amittai was in his willful disobedience to the command of God, a command which he found hard. But all the things that God would have us do are hard for us to do. Remember that. And hence, he often commands us then endeavors to persuade. And if we obey God, we must disobey ourselves. And it is this disobeying ourselves wherein the hardness of obeying God consists. With this sin of disobedience in him, Jonah still further floats at God by seeking to flee from him. He thinks that a ship made by men will carry him into countries where God does not reign, but only the captains of this earth. And so runs Maple's sermon. It's a, it's a great sermon. I encourage you to buy the book, even just to read, to, to read his sermon. But what is it that, that Maple was was highlighting? Well, first of all, he, he was pointing his congregation, and I would point you to the fact of the reality of God's Word. For what does God's Word teach us and show us here from this book of Jonah? Well, surely, my friends, it is this, the folly of trying to flee from God, the absurdity of trying to overrule God, the delusion of our own disobedience and defiance against God. This book sets out for us clearly the reality of God's sovereignty. The fact that we cannot outrun God. That we, frail creatures of the dust, cannot thwart his divine and sovereign purposes. That we cannot hide from him. We cannot run from him. We cannot dethrone him. He is far greater, far grander than any of us. I wonder if you've ever noticed when reading your Bible that, that various Feelings, various emotions are attributed to our God. Uh, graciously, you see, God has penned His Word for us in language and in words and in terminology that we can understand. And therefore, God has taken human language to convey certain truths about Himself so that we might know Him. Therefore, as you read the Bible, you, you come across the emotions that belong to God. He, he, he is a God who loves. He is a God who gets jealous. He is a God who gets angry. He is a God who knows and feels and expresses compassion and, and grief and sorrow. But as you read of the various attributes that characterize God... You never read of him being afraid. You never read of God fearing. Because who, who or what can unsettle or alarm 
the Almighty. A couple of weeks ago, we read from the second psalm, where, as it were, the leaders of this world are pictured as gathering together and, and, and shaking their fist in the face of Almighty God. And what is the picture portrayed by the psalmist there? Is God quivering? Is God shaking and trembling with fear because the people, the men, the, the nations of this world have gathered against him? No, no. He sits in heaven, and what does he do? He laughs. He laughs at them. He laughs at the very absurdity that men, and even the combination of men and nations, would think that they can dethrone this God. The book of Jonah points to the reality of God's Word, and therefore the reality of God's sovereignty, but also the reality of man's stupidity. The reality of man's stupidity. Listen to how old Maple describes Jonah. He says he is a miserable man. Oh, most contemptible and worthy of all scorn, with slouched hat and guilty eye, skulking, skulking from his God, prowling among the ships like a vile burglar, hastening to cross the seas. My friend, is there, is there nothing more serious and is there nothing more stupid and senseless than to place one's hope and confidence in oneself. How futile it is, how stupid it is, that we place our hopes and our confidence and our faith in ourselves and ourselves alone. That we come to the conclusion that we can be the masters of our own fate, the captain of our own fate, that we do not need God or gods. That we become so full of pride and arrogance that we think so much of ourselves that we dare disagree and disobey God and believe, like the prophet that we can run from the maker of heaven and earth and from the all-seeing and all-knowing God. Because this is what we have here. Let me remind you of the opening verses of Jonah. Jonah chapter 1 and verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Adamiah, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for the evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go away with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. The absurdity of it all, the stupidity of it all, yet such was Jonah's response. And sadly, such has been humanity's response from day one in the Garden of Eden. Because the message of Jonah, and, and, and in a sense, the, the message of the, of the whole Bible is clear. The, the message of both prophet and psalmist and apostle and patriarch is gathered up in those words of Amos, the compatriot of Jonah, prepare to meet your God. Prepare to meet your God. This is the reality of God's Word. Jonah thought he could run from God that he could run from the presence of God, but he was about to find out he could not do that because there was appointment with God. God was going to meet him. And my friends, this morning, each one of us here in this room, we have an appointment with God. 
It is appointed unto man, says the Scriptures. It is appointed unto man once to die. But after that, there is the judgment. We have an appointment. So that the message of God to you and to me this morning is this. Prepare. Because you better know that you are going to meet your God. And yet the glorious thing about this day is that it is a day of grace. Because God's word therefore says to us, Seek the Lord while he may be found. And call upon him while he is near. Have you ever realized how, how the Bible finishes? Most of us know how the Bible starts, in the beginning, God. But how does it finish? How does this book conclude? I'm turning over to the 22nd chapter of the book of the Revelation, the last book of your Bible. Because here you see the final proclamation, the final affirmation, and the final supplication in all of the Bible. What do you find? Revelation chapter 22 and verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, and here is the final proclamation, surely I am coming soon. Christ is speaking of his second coming. Christ is giving us this glorious promise at the whole end of the Bible. Prepare to meet your God because I am coming. I am coming soon. And what is the affirmation of the people who believe that and who know that and who are prepared for that? What do they say? How do they respond? Well, look at it. Amen. So be it. Yea, Lord. You have said you're going to come and you're going to meet us. Yea, Lord. Come. Therefore becomes the final supplication. Come, Lord Jesus. And my friends, these words are a test to our Christianity. They're a test of our spirituality. They're a test as to where we are on our spiritual journey. God says through His Word, prepare to meet me. And the Son says, surely, adamantly, certainly, I am coming soon. And the question is, how do we respond to that? Is there an amen in our hearts? Is there gladness in our hearts? Do those words cause hope to rise up in our hearts so that we say with the biblical writers here, Amen, Lord, even so come. Where do you stand this day? What is your relationship this morning with this God? Because the message coming to Jonah and the message to us this morning is this, prepare to meet your God. Because there is the reality of his sovereignty. And sadly, tragically, the reality of our stupidity that we think that we can live for now and forever without God. You cannot escape him. Jonah thought he could, but he couldn't. You might think this morning that you can, but you can't. Because there is a lesson for us to learn here. Not only, not only the reality of God's Word, but I want you to notice also the severity of God's ways. The severity of God's ways. I'm back in Jonah chapter 1, and this time verse 4. Verse 4 of this first chapter. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Notice how the verse begins. 
but the Lord. But the Lord. Here is the divine intervention. The just as verse 3 began with this conjunction. A conjunction that not only adds additional information, but changes the impression and impacts the preceding content. So the, the Lord who commissioned Jonah now responds to Jonah. Verse 3, you notice, begins with the words, but Jonah. But Jonah, verse 3, is met with the but the Lord in verse 4. And as you look at these verses, as you look at these words, as you look at the text, you will see that that Jonah does not respond with a counter-argument to God when God calls him. But he simply and staggeringly defies God and seeks to flee. God gives him his commission. Go to Tarshish. Jonah doesn't sit down to argue with God. He acts. He runs. He flees. He goes to Joppa to get a boat to Tarshish. And therefore the Lord does not respond to Jonah now with explanation as to why he wants him to go to Tarshish, or rather to Nineveh. God does not sit down and and, and, and try to, to clarify his commission. He doesn't seek to amplify his his announcement. But as Jonah has responded to God by action, so God, the Lord, responds to Jonah with action. Verse 4, he hurls this mighty wind at him. He intervenes, and then he reveals the instrumentation he is going to use to arrest Jonah. He hurls a great wind upon the sea. And that word that you have there, hurled, or is the word he flung a great wind at him, is is the same word that you you find in, in 1 Samuel. I'm going to 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 11. 1 Samuel, there earlier on in your Old Testament, 1 Samuel 18 and verse 11, we read these words, And Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. Why this action of Saul? What was Saul's intention here? Well, we're told a little bit later, very clearly, that his intention of of hurling the spear was to kill David. But here in Jonah, the Lord's intention is not to kill his prophet, but to show Jonah that he cannot flee from God, that God can and will pursue him to the ends of the earth. Uh, to, to put verse, verse 4 and the, the action of verse 4 in, in military or naval terms, it would simply be this, that when the Lord hurls this mighty, this great wind upon the sea, it's a shot across Jonah's bow. But the instrument employed was not at this point a spear, but a storm. A great wind hurled a Jonah which sets off a whole chain of events that drives the prophet and the sailors and eventually the Ninevites into the very arms of God's mercy. Because if you notice here, the result of the Lord hurling this great wind upon the sea, the response to it in verse 5 
the mariners hurl out their cargo. And then in verses 12 and 15, Jonah himself is hurled into the sea. God hurls his wind, and there is this repercussion. The cargo and Jonah himself eventually hurled out of the boat. And what's the description of this wind? Well, your version will have, I'm sure, the same as mine. It is described as a great wind. It's, it's the same term that you get in verse 2 when describing the city of Nineveh, this great city. It's the same word that you get that describes the fish in verse 17. It was a great fish. And it's... What is described in chapter 4 when you come to the emotion of Jonah and his anger? It's described also as a great anger. This word actually appears some, some 12 times through this little book. So there's an intervention. God is there. You can't outrun him. There's the instrumentation of this mighty wind. But why this wind? What is the divine intention? Well, you get it at the end of chapter verse 4. It's so that the ship, it's so that the ship itself will break up. Here was the ruinous effect of the Lord's response. The ship was now in danger of bursting asunder. And how often, surely, uh, we, we picture our Lord in our mind's eye as the gentle Jesus. The gentle Jesus, meek and mild. And we long to hear the, the, the sound of the soft sandal Jesus drawing near to us. And we thank God for His gentleness. We thank God for His goodness. We thank God for His grace. Yet we must never forget that joined to His goodness is His severity. Romans chapter 11 and verse 22. Behold the goodness and the severity of our God. A text explained by J.I. Packer in these words, the principle which Paul is applying here is that behind every display of the divine goodness stands a threat of severity in judgment if that goodness is scorned. And that's what we have here. The Lord has called Jonah. He has called his prophet. Arise, go to Nineveh. Here is his goodness being manifested both to prophet and to these people. But Jonah rebels. And with the increased distance between the commission and that rebellion, we see the intensification of Jonah's defiance and thus the manifestation of the Lord's severity. And the picture that you get here is not a pretty one because what the Lord aims at, he hits. He succeeds where Saul fails. And my friends, if you haven't learned already from your life's journey, God moves at times in what are, what are strange and painful ways with us. But as we will see with Jonah, his design, his intention is to produce spiritual fruit in our lives and prepare us for usefulness and glory. But at times the road is hard. At times the night is dark. At times the sea is wild, raging torment. And at times the wind is right into our faces. There is the reality of God's Word. The reality about His sovereignty and our stupidity. And there's the severity of His ways with His people. But then finally this morning... 
There is the certainty of his will, the certainty of God's will. What do we read at the end of verse 4 of this first chapter? The ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was, was fast asleep. So the captain came to him, to, to him and says to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give you a thought to us that we may not perish. The grammatical structure and the terminology used, used in this little book is, is quite fascinating and quite meaningful. For here is the Lord hurling a great wind. Now, many of you here this morning will know that that, that word wind translates the Hebrew word ruah. It's the word that you find in Genesis 1 verse 2. It's the word that you find in Ezekiel 37 5. It's the word that you find in Isaiah 11 4. And in these texts, this, this, this word is associated with God bringing order out of chaos and of bringing life out of death, and of bringing justice in the place of wickedness. And God would use this ruha, God would use this, 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 this wind, this breath, to awaken Jonah and to arouse him and to bring him to his senses. And then the word that is used for tempest here, conveys a, 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 an awful, frightening picture. It's the sight of, 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 if I can describe, of a fitful moonbeams falling upon a, a, a wild, heaving, boiling, troubling, roaring waves of water. A seething mass of water curling and crashing upon this vessel with the intent of mass destruction. And the word also conveys the, the sound, the, the, the siren, the shrieks of the wind as it would blow through the, the ship's rigging. I don't know if you've ever been in a ship in a storm. In 1970, Christine and myself, we were, we were going back to the United Kingdom. And, and uh, uh, the, the route... We, we chose was to go through the Panama Canal, and we first of all went to, the ship went to Sydney, went to Brisbane, and then it came down to, to Wellington in New Zealand. And about a day or so out of Wellington in the South Pacific, we hit this almighty storm. And I remember Christine, I think, was probably sick in the cabin, and I was, I was, I was up near the bridge trying to get some fresh air, and watching this, this craft rise up, looking into the, into the clouds, as it were, and then crashing down in, into the valley of, of, uh, in the face of water, these huge waves, and then the whole thing would rise again and, and crash. And I wonder, how long can this vessel stand such a pounding? Up and down. Walls of waves crashing over its bow, over its decks. But the grace of God, the storm came to an end. But here is this picture here. These mighty waves seeking, intent on destroying, destroying this ship. Here is this storm, mighty in its application, but merciful in its intent. Because the terminology and the grammar also point to this picture. It's the picture of God himself. Not, not, not merely, not simply sending a storm. But God himself, as it were, storming into the sea like some giant wading in and wrecking havoc so that the ship would fall apart. God himself comes to meet the prophet. The language is vivid. And the source of the storm is confirmed. 
when Jonah is hurled into the sea, verse 15, and the sea becomes a calm. God himself rides on the wings of the wind because God's will shall be done on earth as it is in heaven. And his will is that Jonah will return and Nineveh will repent. So what's the lesson I want you to take away from this this morning? What is the lesson for us to learn, even from these early verses? Well, I'm sure you've known and experienced and felt in your Christian life, that those of you here this morning who, who are believers in Christ, that there are times in our lives when, when the Lord our shepherd causes us to lie down in green pastures and beside the still waters, when everything in life just fits perfectly together. Everything is going well for us. There's a gentleness, there's a calmness, there's a quietness about life. And we praise God and thank God for those oases. At other times, His mercy silences our stormy waters, just as Jesus did with His disciples in the boat in that storm. But then there are times when God's mercy is severe and dark clouds roll in and the gale begins to blow and a mighty tempest arises and our hearts are ripped apart and our hopes are dashed and our future fraught with uncertainty. And, and we, we feel overwhelmed by the wave after wave of sorrow and anxiety and despair. And we feel that, that, that somehow God has turned his back on us. That somehow God has, has forsaken us. That God has forgotten us. That God no longer cares for us. That God no longer protects us. That God no longer is answering us. That he is no longer coming to meet us. We, we, we feel deserted. We feel devastated. And we feel driven by panic. So that we feel that we ourselves are about to come apart. Heart. We cry out with the, with the prophet of old, Woe, woe is me, because I am undone. We, we, we sense contradictions between what God says in His Word and His ways with us. And doubt begins to grow in our hearts and minds and in our disappointed and despairing hearts. We wonder, why has this happened to us? Why has this befallen us? What have we done to deserve this? And more significantly, where, where does God stand in relation to, to what's happening to me? Let me respond by pointing you to those words that I read at the beginning of the service. I'm going back to Psalm 104. And the first three verses. Psalm 104. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. What's the psalmist telling us here? Storms. Storms are his chariot, his means to awaken us to our true selves and to his nearness and to hopefulness. You see, my friends, don't conclude that those storms that come into our lives and into your life, don't conclude that the storm that you face 
is always the result of sin in your life. Storms are not always the indication of disobedience like Jonah. Moses. Moses was once up on a mountain that was dreadful, it was frightening, it was terrifying, it was thunder and lightning. But it was the mountain of the Lord. That's where God gave his law. God was there. The storm was not the result of Moses' sin. It was the sense of God's presence. So why, why do times, why do dreadful occasions come into our lives? What are storms designed to produce? They're designed to produce, first of all, a creatureliness, a sense of our creatureliness, an awareness of our own weakness, an acquaintance with our own inadequacies and our limitations. You look at these seasoned sailors here in, in this fifth verse. And what's, what's the picture of these sailors in the storm? They're, 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 they're scared out of their wits. They don't know what to do. They hurl their cargo. Self-confidence is shattered. Their arrogance is wounded. And so panic reduces profit. If you want another picture, a similar picture, go to the New Testament. Go to that 27th chapter of Acts where you have that, that, that uh, shipwreck with the Apostle Paul and you see the terror that filled the minds and the hearts of sailors on that occasion. Because, my friends, the storms that the sovereign God brings to us, He brings to us to show us ourselves. They reveal unsuspecting tendencies in our lives, undreamed of and unthought of insincerities and fears and reactions. It's the storm, it's the calamity, it's the unexpected and the unexplained which exposes us to the very truth about ourselves, that we are not the people we thought we were. God rides upon the storm and comes to us and it becomes a season of self-discovery. We discover a lurking in our minds and hearts attitudes and ambitions that cause us to blush and to be ashamed. The storm blows away the hypocrisy, as it were. The scales from our eyes, and we learn the truth about ourselves. It's a time of self-discovery and self-alarm. So what are storms designed thus to proclaim? As I've said, at times things happen to us which seem to conflict with our concept of God. Because is God not my, my great and good shepherd who is always with me, leading and, and guiding me? Is this not my God, the, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? Is he not my, my heavenly Father who loves me deeply and, and faithfully? And yet here I am, experiencing terrible loss, awful sorrow, bitter disappointment. Here I, here I am as, 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 as a child of the king, facing calamities and catastrophes and unexpected circumstances. And, and so we cry out, my God, tell me, give me some explanation as to why you have allowed this to come into my life. And again, we are compelled to seek for a solution in the book he has given. And as we humbly seek answers, we come to see not just the chariot, 
but him who is riding in it. And we see not just the wind, but him who is coming upon it. And we see not just the darkness and the tempest, but we see his, his nearness. Because faith sees that God is at the heart of every sorrow. And God is at the heart of our every need. And God is at the heart of every darkness. Because by the ministry of the storm, God enriches and enlarges our usefulness in life so that this is the record of God's Word. That in every occasion, as it were, when you see this storm of heaven bursting upon a soul, you see what transformation it brings. You look at Moses. You look at Joseph. You look at David, you look at Hezekiah, you look at Jeremiah, you look at Peter, you look even at the Lord himself. The dark shadows of Gethsemane, the awful storm of Golgotha, and yet what was reaped, what was produced out of such a period, what does the storm proclaim? Strange though it may seem, the storm is God shouting to us about his nearness. It is him arresting our attention that we might learn of him and stop and hear what he has to say. I read basically as an introduction to this message, those words of Mark 6, Jesus going to the disciples. And in that little passage, there, there are three little thoughts I hope, I hope you'll, you, you'll see. The first was this, it was Jesus who sent his disciples into that boat, to that storm. It tells us directly, he sent them. And then they're in the storm, and where's he? He's on dry land. But it tells us he saw them. He saw them. And then he goes to them, and he speaks to them. It is I. Be not afraid. That's his word in the storm. That's what the storm speaks. It is the Savior drawing nigh to us and saying to us, it is I, be not afraid. I'm shaping you. I'm preparing you. I'm preparing you to meet with God in glory forever and forever. The ministry of the storm is the means God employs to weave our garments of holiness. And so while we may fear the darkness that may be encircling us or bursting upon us these days. And the sorrow that fills us, the future that awaits us, the uncertainty that surrounds us. Remember this, my friends. The clouds are his chariot. And he will come nearer to us in the storm than we will ever know him in the stillness. It is the stillness of life that is really, really the scary part of the Christian life. Because when everything is going well, we forget him. We forget him. It's in the storm that we cry out and learn of him. The tempest, the great wind, is coming to us that we might come to him. So don't cast away your confidence, but take heart. For learn this, that God's love must sometimes take unkindly forms in order to bless and to guide us safe home to glory. And in the words of William Cooper, whose hymn we will sing in a moment, you fearful, 
sense. Fresh courage, Tech. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessing on your head. Because God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. May God bless his word to us this morning. Amen. Let us pray.